have for today. This just to make sure that you are in the right place. This is the uh, online WCRP Climate Research Forum for the Eastern Asia subregion, discussing climate research priorities for the coming decade. Um, we've got quite a few more registered than have joined just yet, and I know some people are having trouble getting in. So I will wait a few more minutes to allow as many people as possible to join before I start the actual forum. Just to note, as you're familiarising yourself with this um, platform, that there is a, a chat window where you can have your discussions with people and there is also a Q&A window where you can um, pose questions to us and just a reminder to keep your microphones muted um, unless you're asked to speak. I'm going to go to the next slide which has got some more technical information just to help you all while we before we get started properly. Um, I'm hoping that most of you would have got a link to a document, um, which is either called Know Before You Go or just simply important meeting details for the forum. You can see the link there. Um, it's on the Cliver webpage. So that's got some more information about WebEx and using WebEx for this video conference, um, including how to use the closed captions if you wish to use that. And the other important piece of information here is if you are having technical problems, you can contact um, Inja Jean, um, their email address is just there in red, um, for help with technical problems. So I'm going to wait a couple more minutes before we get started properly. give you a chance to note down those important pieces of information in case you need to. And just also, I think I've said these things to enter your questions. Um, we will have opportunity, I'll explain, um, to discuss your questions. And please feel free to have discussion in the chat window area. We want to make today as participatory as we possibly can for a video conference. Um, and just to let you know that we are recording this um, for a number of reasons. We'll be writing a report on some of the key outcomes, but we were also recording the video conference so others can listen to it later. We want this forum to be as accessible as possible, so we are trialling some closed caption software. Um, as well, and the instructions for how to use that, as I've already said, are uh, in the information that got provided to you. Okay, I don't want to wait too much longer because we've got a fairly tight schedule, but I'm conscious that we're still waiting for a few people to join. So just another minute or so, and then we will get started. I'll just put the um, that link back up in case you wanted it. I think I'll get started now with some introductory comments and hopefully people will continue to join. I'm conscious that we've allowed um, sorry, just reading a message that's come through to me. Um, conscious that we've allowed two hours and we've got a fairly tight schedule, so I don't want us to go over time. So I will move on from this technical guidance and Bring up. This is a, a detailed version of the program. You've already been provided the program, but I thought you might want to see the timing. So there'll be two sessions that you're going to hear my voice quite a lot, talking about the, um, uh, as well as welcoming you, talking about um, the WCIP. And then we have two sessions with invited speakers. Um, uh, firstly, providing a perspective from agencies in the region, and secondly, in session four, um, providing a more of a climate science perspective 
both from a, a, one of our leading researchers in the region on um, the Third Pole Environment Project and also hearing from our early career researchers. And then session five is where we'll have opportunities, we've allowed half an hour there for um, some discussions. So that's the way the program will go. I'll try and keep us to time as best as I can. But let me begin by warmly welcoming you all. Um, my name again is, is Helen Clue, and I am the Vice Chair of the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Programme. Um, on behalf of um, Professor Detlef Stammer, who is the Chair of the JSC and myself and our broader WCRP community, uh, I really warmly welcome you all to this Climate Research Forum <clears throat> for Eastern Asia. Detlef would have very much liked to be here himself in, in person, or at least on video, but the timing make was difficult for him. He has other commitments, and uh, so I will be um, representing he and myself. Um, the WCIP has initiated these regional consultations to inform our wider community about developments <clears throat> that are ongoing within the WCRP and to hear from you about aspects that maybe aren't um, adequately represented in our planning and our thinking. And very importantly, we want to engage with communities who so far may not be familiar with WCRP's work and mission. Um, I just keep getting these little messages coming up, sorry. Um, this includes our next generation scientists who will soon need to carry the climate research forward into a time when climate change will become an even bigger problem for society than it has been before. The need for these climate research forums arose from feedback um, during 2020 that um, the new strategy of the WCRP was perhaps not widely understood or even um, under, uh, being made aware of in the broader climate research community. And indeed, we found that um, many in the climate research community around the world weren't even that familiar with the WCRP itself. And so we decided to run these um, virtual regional consultations around the world by have, holding them virtually in the regions around the world. It meant not only could we choose a compatible time zone, but more importantly, we could target the content and the discussions to the needs of particular nations and particular regions. Our overriding purpose for these forums is very much to showcase and discuss advances in climate science, especially the most pressing science challenges and the frontiers that need to be explored, but also to discuss, importantly, the role that WCRP can play in shaping and strengthening the climate science that is done around the world to ensure that it is relevant to the growing demand um, for climate knowledge, information and services. In essence, our goal is to enhance the quality and relevance of our climate science while strengthening our research community and our leadership through providing a forum like this that enables information sharing and engagement with the broader com um, community. These forums are intended to build on and strengthen the ongoing work of our existing core projects and activities, which I will describe in the next session, which I will come to in a moment. But before I go there, it's very important for me to convey my special thanks to the regional focal points in WCRP who organised today's forum and you can see their names there and also to two project offices, the WCRP International Clivar Office and the S2S, which is the sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction project office, who have done a lot of hard work um, planning for and running today's forum. And I'm very grateful um, to all of them for the work that they have done. So let me now turn to session two, which is about the World Climate Research Programme and our climate future. In 2019, we launched our new strategic plan for the coming decade. This is a document that describes who are the WCRP, what is it that we do, why is that important, and what is our plan for achieving our vision. As part of implementing that strategy, we're developing some new science initiatives, identifying science priorities, as well as refreshing and strengthening our core research activity. 
this short talk describes our climate future in terms of this strategic plan. It's a quite high level presentation, so it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it is intended to be a first step in this broader dialogue. To this end, we really do encourage questions and discussions, um, even though this is virtual, uh, both during this forum, but afterwards as well. We want to hear about your needs and priorities. These will help guide our science planning, and we want to explore how we can work together to achieve our vision of a world that uses sound, relevant, and timely climate science for a more sustainable present and future. So the World Climate Research Program, or WCRP, addresses frontier scientific questions related to the coupled climate system. These are questions that are too large and too complex to be tackled by any single nation or agency or discipline. It really takes a world research program to do this scientific research into the global climate system that includes our oceans and atmosphere, the land and cryosphere, their interactions and their feedbacks with human systems and natural ecosystems. It involves observations, analyses, simulation and modelling, and it requires coordination and deep collaboration around the world and across disciplines. Established in 1980, the WCRP is there to facilitate this coordination. And over the last four decades, it has pioneered climate coordination of the Earth's climate system, especially its predictability and the effect that human activities are having on climate. But looking to the future, we recognise the critical need for climate information that can be used in decision making and managing climate risks and to support climate adaptation planning and climate mitigation policies and strategies. To meet this need, we'll challenge our scientific community. It requires new science and new technologies and new ways of co-designing knowledge and information so that information is relevant and usable. It requires a worldwide coordinated effort and a prepared scientific workforce and strong global partnerships because the WCRP can't do all of, the, can't do all of this on our own. Our new strategic plan addresses these challenges and opportunities for the coming decade. It does that by articulating our vision or aspiration and why this is so important. And it clarifies the purpose or mission of the WCRP. Our purpose or mission is, is about coordinating and facilitating international climate research to develop, share and apply the climate knowledge that contributes to societal well-being. WCRP is not a funding agency. Our mission, our purpose is around coordinating and facilitating international climate research. The strategic plan you can find on that uh, on the website at that URL. There's also a short video that you can look at describes more about our history and our strategy. This schematic summary summarises our strategy, which has four scientific objectives listed there, one to four, from the fundamental understanding of the climate system, processes, variations and changes in that system. Secondly, predicting the near-term evolution of the climate system. Thirdly, refining our ability to anticipate trajectories into the future of climate system change and the long-term response of our climate system. And fourthly, to better integrate natural and social sciences to build a bridge between climate science and societal needs. These, of course, happen across a range of interacting space and time scales. That's the arrow on the right-hand side. And achieving those objectives relies on understanding, observing, modelling and collaboration. These are at the very core of the WCRP, which is why they're in the middle of that circle. This depends critically on infrastructure for observations and modelling, as well as for data sharing and data management and to support communication and outreach. And connecting with the wider science community and stakeholders means that we must build partnerships and address the need for capacity building and education. And throughout all this, engagement and communication must be a priority. Since 2019, we've focused our efforts on implementing the strategic plan. 
especially identifying and prioritising the research that's needed in the decades ahead so that we can achieve our outcomes. One of the new initiatives that we've developed are these activities called Lighthouse Activities, which are a key part of our implementation plan. And I just want to talk about these for a couple of slides. These so-called Lighthouse Activities are aimed at developing the new science, the new technologies, and even new institutional frameworks and mechanisms that are needed to enable society to manage and mitigate climate risks. These lighthouse activities might be major experiments or high visibility projects or infrastructure building blocks. Importantly, they are intended to be ambitious and exciting and very much externally focused and impact focused. As I've said, they are a new and key part of our strategy for delivering robust and actionable climate information. The kind of information that's needed, for example, to address the sustainable development goals of the, new, of the UN or disaster risk reduction plans for vulnerable regions and communities. These lighthouse activities will draw on WCRP's core science and technology and capabilities as well as our strategic partnerships. So the five lighthouse activities that are under design or under construction at the moment are briefly described on this slide with a little thumbnail description if you like for each of them and I'll just quickly um, go through them. The, the first, explaining and predicting earth system change is all about building an integrated capability so that we can explain and provide early warning and predict changes in our earth system globally and regionally. Its focus is the nearer term, the multi-annual two decadal timescales. And it's also about being able to explain what we're seeing, um, the, the changes that we're seeing and attribute what those changes are, are, um, are caused by. My climate risk is all about delivering climate information that is meaningful at the local scale, at the scale at which stakeholders and users of climate information and decision makers need. And that will be through developing a new framework for assessing and explaining regional climate risk. Safe landing climate explores um, the routes to, to climate safe landing spaces for human and natural systems. And this is on a much longer timescale, multi-decadal to centennial timescales. And that requires connecting science, not just our climate science, but also earth system and socioeconomic sciences. And this is where we can explore pathways that are needed to achieve the sustainable development goals. This is also where science around tipping points might get done. The next two are more cross-cutting. Digital Earths is about developing a digital and dynamic representation of the Earth system. This is not just models, it's blending models and observations so that we can explore the past, the present and possible and plausible futures of the Earth system. And you can see that the Digital Earths lighthouse actually might be necessary for some of the other lighthouses that I've already listed. And the WCRP Academy goes towards our capacity building um, part of our strategy to determine the needs for climate research education and what enabling mechanisms are required. It will draw on all aspects of the WCRP core activities. And just on the Academy, they wanted me to let you know that they're very keen to involve the community. If we think of the Academy as being like a marketplace for climate science training, uh, one of their tasks is an annual stock take of available training and gaps. And this, is, this slide is to tell you that there are three ways you can be involved. The first is to be involved in the first stock take, which will happen this year between May and August. The second is to watch for the results of that stock take, which will be published later this year. And maybe you work in an organisation that could provide training to fill any gaps that we find. And we're looking for new members in our working groups. So if you're interested in that um, Lighthouse activity, then please contact Narelle. Her, her email address is there. More broadly, what 
just to let you know about the status of these lighthouse uh, activities, they are all developing their science and business plans at the moment with the goal of developing a draft by the middle of this year, which will then be used for broader consultation throughout the rest of the year. This consultation is very important for many reasons, including these four. We really want to enhance the diversity of the science community that we're engaging with. So we need to do consultation. We want to co-design the activities with key partners and get input from the users of the science. So we need to consult for that reason. We need to make sure that the Lighthouse activities are linked to other for WCRP research. We're also interested in anyone who might want to partner with us to provide funding. And in session five, we'll talk about if you're interested in engaging with these lighthouse activities, how you can do that. That's the lighthouse activities, which are a new initiative as part of our implementation of our strategy. But as well as these, the WCRP will continue to prioritise the science and technologies that are needed to advance our understanding of the multi-scale dynamics of the Earth's climate system and to co-develop the climate information that's needed. As you, can, as you would all understand, there is a vast range of skills and capabilities and disciplines that are required to do that. I've listed some there. The WCRP has fostered and developed these capabilities throughout our existence for over four decades and, the, and has supported the research communities that sit behind those capabilities. These are the very foundation of the climate system science that the WCRP coordinates. Organisationally in the WCRP, they've existed as a large and some might say confusing array of core projects, working groups, panels and advisory councils. So looking forward to the future, we know that it's important to sustain and nurture these communities and these capabilities. But that requires us to focus and strengthen them and to simplify our structure. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about these core projects that support these capabilities and then I'll come to our structure. So many of you who are familiar with the WCRP will know that these four core projects have been uh, part of the WCRP for decades. Um, these represent these four capabilities that we need. Um, CLIVAR is our Climate and Ocean Variability, Predictability and Change core project with its focus on the coupled ocean atmosphere system. GWEX or Global Energy and Water Exchanges focuses on the hydrological cycle and energy fluxes at the Earth's surface and with the and, and exchanges to the atmosphere. Click Climate and Cryosphere looks at the interactions between the cryosphere and the global climate system. While Spark is our atmospheric um, core project, which explores the role of the atmosphere both the stratosphere and troposphere on climate variability and prediction, focusing on atmospheric dynamics, chemistry and climate, and our longer term records. This quick summary does not go anywhere near explaining the breadth and the depth of the science that goes on in those four core projects. They will continue in the new WCRP. I encourage you to look at the websites if you'd like to know more about what they do. They are also linked um, through joint panels and joint activities. But in the new WCRP, we're adding two new core projects. One around our Earth system modelling and observing capabilities, and a second around regional information for societies. The first of these two new core projects on modelling and observational capabilities has the scope of observations, models, and the fusion of models and data, which is going to be important to address some of the science challenges over the de next decade. It will unite and strengthen the work that's already being done under our modelling and data advisory councils and our working groups. The regional information for societies will focus on the science and capability needed to provide societally relevant climate information for regions. It will unite and strengthen the um, work that's being done by Cordex, and the Cordex will continue under the umbrella of that new core project and the work of the working group on regional climate. 
And just to reiterate that the purpose and importance of these two new core projects is to unite and strengthen current activities and current communities, but provide a focus and a vision for the future uh, challenges and science needs. These are under construction at the moment in terms of the science scope and the governance. Over the last decade, many of you will be familiar with the WCRP Grand Challenges that have delivered really critical science. There are seven of them, you can see them there. They will be sunsetting or transitioning over the next couple of years. The, the science that's there that still needs to be done will transition into other activities, or if indeed the questions have been addressed, then that piece of work will conclude. And we are developing ways to acknowledge and celebrate the contribution, which have been actually fundamentally important of these grand challenges. Sorry. Okay, so how does this all fit together? Many, we, we get feedback that says the WCRP is a bit hard to access, to engage with, it's a bit confusing, it's a bit complicated. So here's a simple schematic to summarize these various elements. Um, so this is our new structure for the new WCRP. Um, at the top, we have our Joint Scientific Committee, the JSC, which I've already mentioned. Joint simply refers to the fact that we have three co-sponsors in the WCRP. That's the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, the International um, um, Science Council, the ISC, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, or IOC. We have a secretariat that supports both the JSC and all of our research activities. They're housed in Geneva, but we do have um, membership of that secretariat so sitting at other sites as well. The yellow box down the bottom presents this foundational um, science capability of the WCRP that I've already talked about. Then we have our new lighthouse activities, which I've also described, where much of the cross-cutting research will be done. Drawing on those capabilities um, that sit in that, that yellow um, core projects and research communities. Our, international, our core projects are supported by international project offices and our lighthouses will also have project support as well. And they will continue uh, going forward. And as lastly, there are many other ongoing activities and forums that we will continue to do, whether it be within the lighthouse activities or within the core projects. For example, um, regular frontier science workshops that do brainstorming about what some of the big science challenges are and how we can address them. Um, we might, we will continue to do assessments and rapid updates and syntheses, develop reference data sets and so forth. These are continuing activities that we will continue to do. So we are at the moment in a soft transition to this new WCRP. So here's a timeline perspective of this transition. What we mean by the soft trans transition is really that we're moving into this new structure, six new core, pro six core projects, two new ones, four ongoing and five new lighthouse activities. We're moving into that new structure before all these elements are fully developed. We're going to be living in the new WCRP from this year onwards. But it is a two year timeline for this transition. So 2020, we had lots of consultation and assessments. We're now in the design phase for the new elements, um, the lighthouse activities, the new core projects and plans for transitioning the older elements. We'll have the new structure in place by the end of this year in readiness for 2022. And we want to launch the new WCRP at our second WCRP Open Science Conference in early 2023. We're also writing a implementation plan as well, which will be a dynamic plan, which will continue to be updated. A very quick shout out to our second open science conference in early 2023. The first circular was issued a few days ago, about a week ago. Keep an eye out for more information about that. This will be also where we celebrate uh, some of that work done under the grand challenges that has reached its conclusion. So to draw this one to this part to an end and segue to the next session, this slide is really to reiterate the importance of this being a collaborative effort. 
we, the WCRP community, is very keen to work with all our co-sponsors and our partners and to support our national agencies towards the common goal of making sure that our climate knowledge and information is accessible and relevant to meeting your needs. This is going to require the very best minds across physical climate sciences as well as social sciences and beyond and that means actively engaging with early career researchers who are the next generation of scientists and leaders as well as building strong partnerships with other scientific domains to bring their expertise in. We're very eager to explore ways to better and more effectively engage and work with you. And we hope through this forum and activities after today that this will initiate, will provide an opportunity for this discussion and how we might do this. So that is the end of the talk around the WCRP. In session five, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers and discussion about some of what I've presented. But what I would like to do now is actually move to the next session, which is a series of uh, invited talks. Um, the first, session three, providing an agency perspective on climate science priorities and opportunities for collaboration. And so I will um, now introduce um, Dr. Hyun Soo Lee, who is the director of the Climate Prediction Division with the Korean Meteorological Agency and his talk is on current methodology for climate prediction in the KMA and future research priorities and I will stop sharing so that um, Dr Lee can share his presentation and if we have time we will take one or two quick questions at the end so over to you Dr Lee. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am Hyun Soo Lee uh, from Korea Meteorological Administration. Uh, it's an honor to present here, and I uh, and I hope that uh, this uh, uh, forum will be a good opportunity to motivate our research needs of more uh, accurate climate prediction. Then I'll start my talk. Uh, the contents are mainly composed of four parts. Uh, the first one, the first part, wait a moment. Yeah, uh, the first part of a uh, methodology of climate prediction tradition, uh, I think that uh, the methodology is very similar to most countries. Anyway, uh, KMA uh, participates Dr. Lee, are you still there? Sorry, we just seem to have Lost you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the operational climate prediction, KMA is uh, analyzing various climate monitoring elements uh, such as ENSO, MZAO, AO, snow cover, sea ice, ocean SST, and various types of telecollection patterns. Uh, and then we use their results in the predicted pressure shift patterns. Okay. Uh, and then KMA officially operates GLOSI-5 as a dynamic model. Uh, thus, KMA uh, generates direct outlook uh, using climate analysis and the dynamic model. Uh, in addition, uh, our own model, uh, we collect uh, uh, model research of other countries. Uh, KMA uh, participates in the uh, Global Producing Center and cooperates a uh, lead center for long-range forecast multimodal ensemble in connection with NOAA. Uh, we also use the results of each of the uh, 13 uh, GPCs dynamic models and then apply the resulting MME by lead center. Uh, you can uh, see the, the example of three months outlook by WMO, GPCs, and the lead center multimodal ensemble. 
uh, as a final step, uh, KMA has a, a domestic climate prediction expert meeting for every three months, three months, and participates in the international forum, uh, such as FOCRA 2 uh, for summertime and the uh, East Coast uh, for wintertime outlook over the East Asian region. Uh, KMA uh, produces a uh, final climate outlook through these processes and provides the results to the public through the media and the internet. Uh, you can see the example of a domestic expert meeting consensus forecast. You can see this part. And uh, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the consensus forecast of international expert meeting. You can see the consensus uh, forecast for uh, summertime uh, for East Asian region. Uh, second part uh, is uh, recent uh, increase in abnormal weather condition. Uh, as you know, uh, the East Asian region, including Korea, is uh, uh, influenced by monsoon flow, uh, which uh, is prevailing in uh, northwesterly flow for the winter time and the north uh, southeasterly flow. Uh, for summertime, and uh, recently, abnormal weather condition is uh, is in Korea have been increasing. Uh, I we experienced the longest rainy season uh, in the last summer and uh, record breaking high temperature in winter 2019 and 20, and the largest number of typhoon impact in 19 uh, 20, 2019. And then uh, extreme value of summer temperature in 2018. Uh, so uh, we suggest that research priorities should be mainly related to the predictability for the occurrence of abnormal red patterns. A third part is uh, for the climate research priorities during summer. Uh, I think that uh, most predictions are difficult, but especially East Asia is located on the border between Asian continent and the Pacific Ocean. So it's very difficult to predict. As you can see, uh, Korea is uh, mainly influenced by a thermal high, Tibetan high, and OSC high, and uh, uh, primarily uh, Western North Pacific high. Uh, so, uh, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, main uh, air masses, uh, we focus, we focus, we mainly focus on the development or uh, intensity of Western North Pacific High and the Tibetan High. Uh, WMP uh, Western North Pacific High is the most influential uh, high pressure in related to summertime heat wave and is influenced by the convective activity uh, over the Western Pacific Ocean. But unlike the typical two-cell type of PJ pattern and three-cell or mixed patterns occur frequently lately, uh, so we plan to focus on the relationship with the Indian Ocean SST, MJO, Arctic Oscillation, and the Blocking High as factors uh, that affect WNPH. And then uh, Tibetan high and uh, thermal high over Mongolia and uh, northern China uh, greatly affected the 20, 20, 2016 and the 2018 summer heat waves. According to our previous study, uh, two highs are closely correlated with snow cover over Tibetan plateau and the circumpolar teleconnection pattern. Uh, thus, uh, I think that uh, these uh, future research priorities during summer are mainly focused on uh, these two uh, or three high pressure systems. A third part is uh, for the research priorities during winter time. Uh, as you know, uh, East Asia is mainly influenced by the Siberian high. Uh, for during uh, uh, winter time, as you can see, the main uh, typical uh, pressure pattern uh, for uh, middle atmosphere and surface layer. Uh, uh, according to our experience and the previous study, 
uh, for cold winter case, uh, Siberian high um, uh, migrates from uh, inland uh, Siberian region to uh, the east, uh, southern part of East Asian region. And for the warmer winter, uh, high pressure, uh, Siberian high pressure uh, is weaker than normal or uh, migrates northward. Uh, so uh, we uh, we hope we mainly focus on the uh, the development intensity of Siberian high. Uh, general in general, uh, El Nino and La Nina is uh, uh, greatly influencing in Korea for early winter. Uh, so uh, Korea uh, uh, KMA is uh, operationally using Arctic sea ice, uh, Arctic uh, oscillation, and Eurasian snow cover, and the QBO and the long-term trend for uh, temperature and uh, precipitation and uh, blocking high possibility for the wintertime climate outlook. Uh, among the uh, climate factors just uh, uh, I, I, I just uh, mentioned, KMA is paying attention to uh, active oscillation and the blocking activity. A uh, relatively long-term cold warm episode over East Asia is strongly correlated with AO phase and uh, the occurrence of uh, blocking patterns over the Siberian and the Bering Sea. Uh, however, the predictability of uh, AO and the blocking is very low and it, uh, its uncertainty is very high. Uh, therefore, uh, KMA proposed to focus our research on these related areas in the future. Uh, the last part is for future research priorities of dynamic model. Uh, KMA has been uh, operating GLOSI-5 GC2 version uh, and exchanging ensembles with UKMO uh, since April 2016. Uh, KMA is uh, under upgrade to global uh, GLOSI-6 and will operationally run in, uh, 20, uh, in this year. Uh, in this in addition, we will be uh, contributing to the improvement of model performance and uh, with performance with academic partners in the future. Uh, according to our experience, uh, the analytic and the statistical results of climate factors are more accurate than dynamic model results for the climate prediction. Uh, nevertheless, the characteristic analysis of model results and the merged the research of model and the climate monitoring elements are quite uh, efficient guidance. So we will continue our research in this field. That's all. So thank you for your information. Uh, uh, attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Lee. We very much appreciate um, hearing some of the priority research areas um, from KMA regarding climate modeling. Um, I'm just checking, we don't have any questions at this stage, so we will move to the next talk. We might have some more questions during session five. So the next invited speaker is, um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome um, Mr. Yoshinori Aikawa, who's from the Tokyo um, Climate Centre, and he's already got his talk up. So you can see that he will be talking about climate services from the Tokyo Climate Center and research needs for the future. And I will mute and hand over to Yoshinori. Thank you. We can't hear you yet if you're speaking. And you need that. Ah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you see my presentation file? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Well, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Yoshinori Oikawa speaking from Japan. Uh, I am a senior scientific officer for operational seasonal forecast uh, working for Tokyo Climate Center, Japan Meteorological Agency. Uh, I am very delighted to be here to contribute to this important uh, meeting. So uh, 
that's the beginning. Uh, let me uh, make a brief introduction to our uh, organization, uh, that is activity of uh, Tokyo Crime Center. Uh, Tokyo Crime Center uh, is a part of uh, the Japan Meteorological Agency and uh, one of the re regional climate centers uh, designated uh, WMO and <clears throat> has been serving as a, a regional climate center for the uh, regional associate, association uh, region two. Uh, that is uh, uh, Asian uh, region uh, since 2009. So our, our main purpose of our activity is uh, to provide uh, climate data or prediction data or climate analysis results and <coughs> capacity development opportunities with uh, mainly uh, Asian nations. So uh, this is a, a snapshot of our website. Uh, we provide uh, various kind of climate related informations uh, through this website. So if you, if you are interested in, please uh, visit uh, here uh, this URL. So, and this is just a short example of our domestic services, uh, TCC is uh, working for the domestic users as a climate prediction division in of the JMA. So we provide uh, one month uh, seasonal prediction uh, issued every week and three months climate prediction uh, every month and warm or cold season predictions uh, issued twice uh, every year. So <clears throat> now uh, let me go on to the, my main uh, part of this presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so before that, uh, let me make a brief introduction to the uh, East Asian summer climate. Uh, just for those uh, not very familiar with the East, uh, East Asian climate. So, this for bar chart uh, on the right side uh, indicates monthly climatological uh, precipitation amount in four Asian countries, cities, Tokyo, Kagoshima, Mokpo, and Nanchan. So you can see uh, every city experience uh, peak of precipitation uh, from June to July. This is because uh, due to uh, southwest monsoon in early summer. So this southwest, southwest monsoon conveys a large amount of water vapor into East Asian regions and you know, sometimes this uh, wet inflow brings about very extremely, extremely heavy precipitation and causes front out on landslides. So this is a very recent example of uh, summer monsoon related disaster. We have had a very bad early summer last year uh, extremely heavy rainfall in July 2020. Uh, the summer sunset monsoon uh, last year uh, brought about a uh, very lot of uh, rainfall and that caused a flood or inundation or landslide, uh, very severe uh, disastrous uh, results. Uh, mainly across the Western Japan and Eastern Japan. Uh, <clears throat> the situation was similar in East China, Eastern China, 
uh, because uh, Eastern China and Korea and Japan uh, commonly affected by the southeast uh, monsoon. So active south monsoon activity last year brought uh, record-breaking precipitation in Yangtze River Basin as well. So uh, record-breaking uh, cumulative precipitation as uh, observed in the uh, river basin. So uh, what caused this uh, very active 2020 uh, summer rainfall? And this uh, sentence is uh, my uh, message I would like to convey through my presentation, so uh, just in advance. So summer heavy rainfall events in East Asia, the individual occurrences of these seem to be very local and come from mesoscale dynamics by nature. But in fact, uh, these rainfall events are collectively affected by the large scale uh, atmosphere uh, ocean dynamics. So uh, let's look uh, into details. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry for a little bit uh, complicated figures, uh, but uh, look at the top right uh, figure. So <coughs> this fig figure indicates a stream function field anomalies uh, at 850 hectopascal uh, analyzed using uh, JLA55 dataset. So you can see the very distinctive uh, anti-cyclonic circulation anomalies extending from South China Sea to uh, southeast of Japan. So this uh, enhanced anti-cyclonic circulation brings uh, this clockwise uh, wind anomalies and brought a huge amount of water vapor amount uh, into East Asian region. And why? Why? Uh, what made uh, this anticyclonic, uh, a strong anticyclonic anomalies? Uh, according to our analysis, uh, this is mainly due to the uh, conditions observed in tropical Indian Ocean. So uh, please look at the top left here. Uh, this is uh, this shows uh, OLR, outgoing long wave radiation for July 2000, uh, 2020. Uh, blue colored areas indicates active convection. Uh, Talk clouds, uh, cumulative cloud cumulus crowd areas and so this situation uh, indicates uh, there was a uh, very distinct heat source in the upper troposphere above the western tropical indian ocean and next uh, look at the bottom right figure this is a um, model experiment experiment example uh, again, showing the stream function anomalies at 850. In this uh, model experiment, we gave uh, heat source around here, very similar to the actual uh, conditions uh, last summer. So our model uh, results indicated a very similar response uh, strong anti-cyclonic anti circulation anomalies, uh, very similar to the actual uh, circulation anomalies observed last summer. So, and why the active convection uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean? Uh, this is a global SST anomalies uh, July last year. Uh, we observed uh, very warm SST across the tropical Indian Ocean. And 
But I, I would like to further, further trace back the causal chain of this uh, high SSTs. This uh, global SST figures is uh, indicates uh, uh, anomalies for from August to October 2019. Uh, this year we observed very a dis distinctive positive Indian Ocean dipole mode, like this. And <clears throat> this in uh, strong Indian Ocean dipole mode, uh, according to our analysis, is uh, causally linked to the high SST last uh, last summer. Uh, this is. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, analysis for the inside ocean. Uh, right high uh, right hand figure indicates the time longitude ocean heat content anomalies uh, averaged over ten to six uh, degrees uh, in southern hemisphere. Uh, this Hochmera diagram indicates. Uh, west of the propagating wave, uh, probably Rossby wave in the ocean, uh, propagating from uh, autumn 2019 to the uh, spring 2020. And this Rossby uh, wave propagation is Followed by eastward propagation of Kelvin waves. Uh, the, the left size figure is, is indicates uh, again OHC anomalies along the equator. Okay. So, sorry. So what uh, I am trying to say is uh, uh, very heavy rainfall. Uh, we experienced uh, last July was uh, likely uh, connected or can be traced back to uh, the positive Indian Ocean type of mode in 2019. So, summary. <laughs> In early summer, southwest monsoon transports a uh, huge amount of water vapor into East Asian countries and sometimes heavy rainfall and disasters. So, and heavy rainfall events collectively affected large scale atmosphere and ocean dynamics. And one of the examples of this is observed uh, last summer uh, in July 2000. 20, remarkably active southwest most in East Asia was one of primary factors behind the extreme rainfall event. And the causal chain leading to this active monsoon can be traced back to uh, ultimately a distinctively positive IOD mode in the previous year, uh, that is 2019. And this indicates a source of predictability for the East Asia monsoon with a lead time of at least half a year, and this might be found in the Indian Ocean. And as an operational seasonal forecaster, I um, and I and my my colleagues are wondering when, how, and under what condition can this source of predictability be exploited. So improved scientific understanding of the large scale, uh, likely multi-year circulation variability is required. So other East Asian countries would commonly benefit from the advancement of monsoon predictability of, for the sake of disaster preparedness and mitigation. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was very interesting to see um, possibilities 
for predict, better predictability for weather events that clearly have huge impact. Um, thank you very much. We don't have any questions yet, but again, there might be opportunity in the last session. So I'm going to now introduce our third invited speaker. Um, so I'll welcome uh, Professor Panmo Dai, who will talk to us. He's from the Chinese um, um, Meteorological um, Agency and he will he's a chief scientist and he will be talking to us about towards understanding changes in extreme weather and climate events in the east asia monsoon region over to you professor Jai. thank you uh, uh, thank you uh, dear colleagues very glad to participate in this afternoon's session and uh, i'm glad to hear two of the uh, Previous colleagues, you know, and uh, provide uh, some operational activities in the uh, National Climate Center. Actually, in under National uh, China Meteorological Administration, we also have a National Climate Center, uh, or you can be BCC Beijing Climate Center, almost uh, having the same operational activity. Uh, today, my talk is uh, what I try to more focus on the uh, on how uh, understanding the uh, changes, extreme events, and how to uh, link in the context of the monsoon uh, region. And oops. Uh, from this slide, you can see actually this is a. Uh, 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 from IPCC, uh, uh, Special Report 1.5. Uh, IPCC declared that human activities have approximately caused global warming above pre-industrial level in about one degree uh, uh, since the pre-industrial level. And uh, you see the yellow line reflect the human caused warming trend throughout the day, uh, since 1850. Uh, however, you know, uh, behind you, you see the gray bars that represent monthly anomaly of global mean temperature. You see the monthly anomaly also uh, changing uh, under the background of global warming. So that we can see uh, actually that even the short-term climate is strongly influenced by the, uh, the the climate warming trend, and in other words, also influenced by the human activities. Uh, this figure showing not only uh, say uh, the upper panel is uh, I have two curves there. The yellow one is for the region in China. You can. Yeah, some, something like standard for East Asia. And uh, the green, uh, the blue one is for the global mean surface temperature. You see, uh, uh, the regional climate warming is faster than the, the global warming. And also, you see larger uh, inter annual variability compared with global mean. And the middle one is, uh, and uh, the bottom panel. Are, uh, are the time series removed uh, after removing the long term trend? You see clearly a you know, signal there. So, in the time, even in the global or regional mean temperature time series, we can see both uh, long term trend and also inter annual variability, especially ENSO uh, influences. Uh, regionally, you know, we see the, the, the map, it, we, we see the, the, the global warming is more, more obvious in the Arctic region, in the highlight region, and also higher in the land compared with ocean. In land areas, you know, in the same latitude, more or less quite uh, homogeneous. Uh, East Asia region is yes, uh, next to the Pacific, you see. And uh, strongly, we can, you know, you see, even under the global warming background, there is contrast between uh, the different warmings compared with land and the ocean. 
Uh, we already see uh, the heat wave that have clearly trained there and that can be attributed to the human activities. So it is a heat wave uh, based on our research. We see more become more widespread in, in Asia, or we can see uh, in East Asia. And uh, that also can be attributed to the uh, human activities, especially the green, greenhouse gas forcing is the dominant driver. Uh, for precipitation, a uh, little bit more complex, you see uh, in the middle, this is a map for the long-term trend. I think data is since 1961 to 2019. And uh, you see a lot of originality there, although in the higher latitudes, we have increased rainfall. However, in the East Asia area, you know, the, 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 the pattern are different compared with other continent areas. Yeah. Uh, as for the strong Anino in 2015, 20, 2016 uh, impact on the uh, precipitation in China, I did a, an, an experiment say that figure, figure A is composite, you know, for, for, for all the Arduinos. And uh, the figure B is a long-term trend for the precipitation change over China. Uh, two signal put them together, you see very cl uh, close to the, uh, the, 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 the figure D, C and D, you see very, very similar. If we, you know, take into, Two signal, one is a long term trend, another is a linear signal. So that pattern really can reflect two uh, to, to signal influences. And uh, I want to do not want to elaborate with this how ANSO impact on the, uh, on the circulation link to the precipitation in China. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have heard in uh, the, the previous presentation about last year's precipitation. What I'm going to want to stress here is this year's uh, figure, you know, reflecting total precipitation and extreme precipitation. Actually, extreme precipitation is a dark colored one. And uh, uh, for, for the early summer, June, July, the Yangtze River Valley, we, we, we call that a May rainfall. It's something East Asia monsoon rainfall. You see, not only signal, not only reflect the uh, in the annual variability, but also you see a clear trend there. But uh, still, it's difficult for us to 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 answer if in if there is human activity in the contribution to 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 the uh, extreme precipitation or like uh, the, the, the precipitation change in, in the monsoon region. I think that's, uh, that's still an, an, a big issue to us. But uh, direct, based on direct observation, there, there, there is some, some uh, signal there. And we all know uh, uh, in the past five years or, or decades, a lot of world project you know, on, on attribution studies and uh, also some studies link to the uh, extra attribution to the extreme events. I think one of the important breakthrough is on the extreme, extreme event attribution. So here I gave an example, say early July, Euro, 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 European countries, they had, they, they, they experienced early July, 2018, the, they experienced a severe, a very heavy uh, heat wave. Then very soon, the news media, they released, they say the probability has increased by 100% due to the human influences. And we can see very quickly the paper published by the Nature. So last year, uh, MIT also, the uh, M M MIT uh, review selects climate change attribution as a breakthrough for 2020. It's a link to the heavy pre precipitation events in the United States. So we can see now even a 
uh, a single event they can link to attribute to the link to the climate change signal. So uh, for, for the monsoon region, if we want to understand the extreme events, uh, I think at the first we should uh, both, uh, you know, notice the climate in our region is changing. And uh, we should, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to study uh, the extreme weather and climate even, events in the context of the climate change. And also uh, to understand the extreme events we should uh, uh, to study in a regional monsoon perspective, because uh, a monsoon region is totally different. And uh, even, you know, for, for precipitation, extreme precipitation attribution in monsoon region, it's uh, uh, complex because influenced by land, ocean, uh, contrast, heat contrast, and also aerosol, influences, greenhouse influences, and also a lot of circulation, uh, ocean dynamics, land uh, forces, all forces all play rule, rules for, the, for, for our region. And uh, to understand the mechanism, uh, to, uh, especially for the causes and attributions of extreme events, we, we need to look uh, at least inside the land, ocean, atmosphere, or cryosphere, you know, in, 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 the, in that context. And also need to consider the external forcing, especially the human activities. Even for the prediction techniques in the future, uh, I think we need to consider both natural and human influences. And uh, to provide a better service for the for social economic development, I think, as I, to study the impacts and the risks for extreme events, uh, also very, very uh, important. Uh, my my talk will be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jai, and thanks to all three speakers from our three agencies. I can see. I know in the chat we've been talking about um, the alignment between what some of the research priorities that you're seeing uh, and some of what we're called the science we're coordinating in the WCRP we do have some questions but if it's okay with the questioners what I'd like to do is to keep those questions to session five and use them as an opportunity to start a discussion is that okay with our three speakers to wait until um, another 40 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, that that's okay? all right. Yeah, is that okay? And then we can use those questions to perhaps provoke uh, a nice discussion. So I hope that's okay. In which case, and our speakers are very organized, <laughs> uh, we move to session four, which has now got um, um, perhaps uh, a little bit more of a science focus, although I don't really think it's a big shift, but we did, we're delighted that Professor Tan Dong Yao is able to join us to explain to our community um, this new, that was not new, but this important project called the Third Pole Environment. And so I really look forward to hearing that talk and then we'll hear from our early career scientists. So Professor Yao, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, great pleasure to be uh, uh, here to present uh, some of our studies of the third pole environment, we briefly call TPE. Uh, in this talk, I would like to present the TPE Asian Water Power Change Study. Uh, So the Tibetan Plateau with its surrounding is uh, referred as the third pole. It covers five million square kilometers in area with an elevation higher than 4,000 meters by average. Uh, of course, its behavior impacts more than 2 billion people in this region. Okay. 
So uh, very recently, maybe uh, it's a paper published uh, three years ago by a scientist in Netherlands called the Asian Water Power, because in this region, all the major Asian rivers are originated from the high plateau, including uh, Yangtze, Huanghe, Ganges, and other big rivers. Uh, but the climate in this region is uh, increasing, it's warming very rapidly. It's uh, uh, increasing altitude is uh, large uh, than the global average, twice as large as the global average, actually. Uh, so the prediction of the future is about uh, three to four degrees C uh, at the largest um, until 2050. So what the consequence of the uh, abnormal warming in this region is uh, actually systematic, including glacial melt, uh, permafrost degradation, uh, Next question, round of increasing, uh, divergence, because most of the rivers are increasing, but some river uh, still uh, decreasing in discharge. So of course the most significant change is glaciers. Uh, for glaciers we have uh, uh, equilibrium line, we have mass balance, we have area, we have uh, uh, terminal length. Uh, just talk about mass balance. Uh, for this region, the largest uh, glacial mass loss is, is in the southeastern part. If you go to the interior, it's uh, decreasing gradually. If you go to the north, northwestern part, actually uh, some glaciers are still uh, uh, gaining mass. That means you they have more positive mass balance. Uh, so for this uh, rapid glacial melting, we have a lot of uh, consequences, including uh, uh, glacial collapse, uh, uh, glacial lake outflood flood, uh, including uh, slow avalanches and uh, floods. Uh, of course, uh, we had uh, a lot of effort to measure the change uh, in a kind of uh, earth system approach, including glaciers and permafrost, slow cover, lakes, and the rivers. Uh, we have uh, about 60-something uh, uh, glacier monitoring sites, uh, including glacial thickness, uh, glacial mass balance, and we have uh, some sites for permafrost melting measurements and uh, including uh, meteorological stations at the uh, 16 sites. And we also have uh, snow cover monitoring sites. And we have about 30 hydrological and meteorological monitoring sites uh, to just to see what the atmosphere and uh, hydrosphere are changing. Uh, it's very new that uh, uh, there's a new disaster called the uh, ice collapse or glacial collapse. Uh, first was in 2016 in the northwest of the plateau called Aru. And uh, another was to uh, 2018 in north, uh, southeastern Japan plateau called Sedumpi. And uh, very recently, this uh, new one was in southern Himalaya. Uh, maybe you uh, read up on a lot of news about the consequence of this uh, ice collapse. The flood of the ice collapse uh, destroyed the villages and uh, the hydropower stations uh, in India. So after the 2018 ice collapse in southeastern Japan Plateau, actually we are continuously observing uh, the collapse because we are sure that uh, this is not only one or just a few. It will be normal status in the future that ice collapse will be happening in this region. Uh, and uh, we observed this valley, uh, which uh, actually 
uh, it's a, uh, a very uh, frequent ice claps happening site because uh, this spring we observed a lot of uh, by our uh, monitoring system. So that means uh, ice claps is uh, getting more serious in this region. Of course, all the changes in this region is uh, causing by uh, the atmospheric circulation systems, including uh, India monsoon and the westerly. So, so we have a kind of called the big cross uh, for the Indian monsoon from the south to north and uh, from the west is from the east to the west. So that's why uh, nature had a comment uh, two years ago about the observing systems in the third pole region. Uh, but the change in this region is not only local, it's uh, regional or even global. Uh, because we found that impact of the third pole environment change on surrounding regions, all the Asian water tower change on the surrounding regions, uh, including uh, the big lakes region in Central Asia and the big rivers region in South Asia. So that's why we had a kind of uh, global collaboration for the studies in the region. Uh, so the talk about Big Lake, the biggest one, actually is the biggest one in the world, uh, the Arrow Sea, which was uh, 68,000 square kilometer in 1960. But now it's around 3,000 square kilometers. So that's why actually uh, UN Secretary General, Mr. Uh, Antonio uh, Guterres visited this place and uh, he warned that the Arrow Sea uh, progressive disappearance is probably the biggest ecological catastrophe in our time. Uh, so in this case, uh, I talk about the mission, new mission for the third pole environment. That's why the third, third pole environment is uh, focused on the Asian water tower change study. The third polar environment pro program is uh, initiated in 2009 and endorsed in 2011 by UNESCO, uh, UNEP, and the SCOPE. And now we have uh, five centers worldwide in the US, in Sweden, in Germany, in Beijing, and Kathmandu. And we have uh, some kind of original centers in surrounding regions. And recently, we have uh, two big programs to support the TP uh, activity. One is called Pan Third Pole Environment. Another is called the uh, Second Spain Plateau uh, pro Program. Uh, actually, the Second Spain, uh, Second Spain Plateau Program, its full name is called the Second Spain Plateau Scientific Expedition and Research. Simply called the step. Uh, so the Asian water tower is uh, one of the major focuses. Uh, for this program, uh, we also have uh, uh, collaboration with the international organizations such as uh, WMO, UNEP, and UNESCO. And we have uh, uh, collaboration with the programs such as uh, Codex uh, and other programs. And uh, the key scientists in this program is uh, from uh, Germany, US, uh, Sweden, uh, France, uh, Netherlands, uh, United Kingdom, and Norway. And uh, maybe you know that Professor Daniel Chen is also uh, leading a program uh, in Codex, uh, which, uh, re which is uh, related to the third pole environment. So for our study, we have some urgent questions. Uh, how much water does the Asian water tower provide to Asian countries? And what is the uh, impact of future change of Asian water tower? How do the convergence between vapor, solid, liquid water faces impact environment in Asia or even globe? Uh, I just heard that uh, two talks from Korea from uh, Japan that might the uh, it, it might be possible that the climate change in Korea and Korea and Japan 
that is impacted by the change over the expanded plateau. How to improve the function of the water and the ecology to foster the sustainability of Asia or beyond? How to reduce the acidity to predict the future and climate change? We are planning some kind of uh, more meetings for discussion of this kind of questions and uh, even for uh, implementations. Uh, why is in November, we are planning on 10th to 11th. Uh, that's, uh, we have already had a nine TP workshops and we will have a 10th this year. And another one is uh, HU fall meeting in San Francisco. Uh, it's usually December 9 to 13. And uh, we will discuss more about the questions and the future studies for the Asian water tower changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yao, for that talk. Uh, as with the others, we'll hold questions until the next session um, so that we can have a good discussion. So I'm now going to introduce my colleague, the regional focal point from Japan, um, Dr. Hyungjun uh, Kim, who will introduce the early career scientist part of this forum. I'll mute and hand over to him. Okay, uh, thank you, Helen. So I think I'm you hear me, right? Yes, we can. I assume you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hyungjun Kim, uh, working at the University of Tokyo, Japan, and also co lead of the BCRP Regional Focus Point East Asia. Uh, so, thank you for joining in this event, and I hope you are enjoying this so far. And now it is the time for early career scientists in East Asia. Actually, we realized the BCRP is uh, missing a community momentum from early career scientists representing especially for this region. And it should be crucial to get them involved in the WCRP activities for the WCRP's sustainable future. And uh, as the initial effort, we organized this dedicated session to ECS to discuss how can early, science, early career scientists benefit from the WCRP. Actually, we have six pre presenters from China, Japan, and Korea, and they will share their research and connections with the WCRP initiative and activities. Uh, fortunately, uh, it spans pretty much broad fields from oceanic and atmospheric science to land hydrology. Dr. Fei Li and Chi Xu from China, and Dr. Misa Kautono and Nobu Yutsumi from Japan, and Dr. Mini Chang and uh, Kang Yan Song from Korea prepared this session. I hope you enjoy and get some information to practically connect your research and WCRP. As you know, 30 minutes discussion will be followed after this session. So uh, please feel free to get the presenters and uh, uh, get, get us, uh, your feedback. And well, those comments suggestions would be uh, invaluable to form a better WCRP for East Asia. Okay. Thank you. So please go ahead. Can I hear you? Hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> See my screen? See my screen? Yes, we can. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to join this meeting and introduce myself. I'm Fei Li, Assistant Researcher in Nansenju International Center, Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Chinese Academy of Science. My research has been focused on large-scale atmospheric dynamics, Arctic mid-latitude interactions, climate modeling, and prediction. First, I would like to introduce our recent research. Arctic sea ice intensifies aerosol transport to the Tibetan Plateau. 
introduced by Professor Chen Dongyao, the environment in Tibetan plateau is very important. Let's look at the top figure. It shows that Arctic sea ice is closely related to the westerly wind anomalies around the Tibetan plateau, as shown in better vectors. And this wind anomalies favors the accumulation of aerosols at the southern boundary of the Tibetan plateau, as shown in better red shading. And look at the vertical structure at the bottom. The westerly wind anomalies the aerosols at the bottom pass over the Himalaya mountains and the further north into the interior of Tibetan plateau. And then I will introduce um, WCRP project. S2S prediction project is not less um, involved. It is an international project aimed at qualifying snow initialization impact on S2S forecasts. Based on this project, we have developed the first generation S2S prediction system using Norwegian climate prediction model. Hello, everyone. My name is Chi Su. Uh, I'm now an associate uh, pro professor in the first institute of oceanography, a Ministry of Natural Resources of China. And my research area is the Arctic Ocean. And my interests uh, include uh, uh, the climate change in the Arctic Ocean, uh, active climate simulations and predictions using the coupled climate models. Uh, now I'm, uh, I'm a key player in developing the climate models of FLESM, named by our institute. Uh, in the past few years, our model uh, has contributed to the two phases of the a coupled, uh, coupled model in the comparison project, theme 5 and theme 6. Uh, through participating in the semi project, uh, I have learned a lot. And at the same time, uh, my research also benefits a lot from this uh, uh, WCRP project. Uh, for example, uh, more than 50% of my published papers are related to this project. Uh, so I believe that more and more early career researchers uh, who care about uh, the East uh, Asian climate uh, will also benefit a lot from the WCRP activities. Next slide. Hey. Come on. Just a line. Is there some problem with Try again. So you can keep talking, Chief. You can keep talking. about the potential mutual benefits between early career scientists and the WCRP. WCRP was and engaged ECRs thorough research data, such as CMAT5, CMAT6, S2S, CCTP. Also research method. Young scientists can learn experimental design from several projects. They can also get knowledge from meeting news reports and the publication. WCRP also provide a platform such as Yes Community Joint Early Career Researcher Workshop. CRS also benefits for a sustainable WCRP. CRS have been brought together and cooperate from all regions in the world. So we have one concern. We hope there will be more activities and the projects open for ECRS. Response to Professor Fang Li Qiao. We would like to in initiate an ECS network on climate research in East Asia. That's all from our side. Uh, 
Um, let me share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, yes, great. We can. Uh, hello, uh, thank you to the organizers for the chance for us to talk today. Um, we'd like to first briefly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Misako Hotono. Uh, I am currently an assistant professor at Hiroshima University in Japan. Um, I've been tackling a few different uh, research topics in the past few years with inundation climate interaction, where we try to see uh, how river inundation affects the atmospheric conditions as opposed to the other way around, which may be a bit uh, more traditional. And I've also been developing uh, high resolution long term precipitation data sets for Japan. And recently, I'm more focused on sediment dynamics modeling, where we try to see how, uh, how much sediment goes to the oceans globally. Um, when researching about WCRP, so to prepare for today's uh, talk, uh, I realized that a lot of uh, my research can be associated with WCRP elements, uh, like core projects like JUEX or some co-sponsored activities and also uh, grant challenges like weather and climate streams and like uh, carbon feedbacks in the climate system. And this is Nobu Kiyotsumi. Kyoto University of Advanced Science. Uh, my early research topic was about extreme precipitation dependency on temperature, which was published in 2011. And then the quantification of the contributions of synoptic weather systems to present and future precipitation. And all of them are related to WCRP activities like GX and the Grand Challenge. And I used the CIMI 5 data. And recently, I extended my research topic to satellite remote sensing of precipitation. And I believe it is relevant to some of the grand challenges and also the, uh, some of the lighthouse activities. Um, so I like to give our thoughts as early career scientists, um, how we can better benefit from WCRP. I think uh, transparency of projects and activities and panels and such are very important because I think when starting out, uh, these large organizations can be a bit intimidating, um, for me at least, uh, because it seems it can seem like senior researchers that we may not personally know are in charge of a lot of things. And also, uh, I think a big benefit of having people from different uh, stages in their career is the transfer of knowledge uh, from senior members, probably in our case, for example, about, tip uh, about tips of funding acquisitions or how to start collaborative research with people who may not be in uh, your circle. And also uh, potential mutual benefits so that we can bring something to the table as well. Uh, I think we can start out with participating in relevant project meetings. Um, for us, it would give us an opportunity to obtain knowledge and experience on how the big decisions are made. And I think for the WCRP side, uh, it can give them a chance to engage with potential future core members. And we want to share our concern. Uh, Misako and I are originally from civil engineering, majoring in hydrology. And I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering now for remote sensing. And civil engineering, such as hydrology and uh, electrical engineering, such as remote sensing, have contributed to WCRP climate study, I believe. But they often have limited access to journals for climate and atmospheric sciences because of the limited contracts with the journals. And I think this is a big obstacle for the interdisciplinary study I understand WCLP is not a funding agency, but they, are, they can do something such as to encourage people to post their preprints to existing services like archive or research gate. So it would be great if WCLP can facilitate the discussion on this concern. And this is the last slide. Uh, this is the situation for many researchers outside uh, atmospheric sciences. Uh, this, uh, for example, for the Journal of Climate, there's almost no paper that I can read from my office. This is a situation. That's it from us. 
Thank you. Okay, next, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gangin Sung, and I'm a research assistant in the Levasable Climate Change Research Center in Yonsei University, South Korea. And this is the, my uh, educational background. And I briefly introduced what I did and what I'm doing. So most of my research is based on the numerical modeling especially for the sub-seasonal to seasonal predictions and long-term predictions. And also I'm interested in the stratosphere troposphere interactions. When I was in the graduate, when I was PhD student, I studied stratospheric certain warming event, which is which is very extreme event in the polar stratosphere and its predictability. Um, Mini and I prepare this slide together, but Mini will do the rest of things for the uh, smooth presentations. So let's move on to the next speaker, Mini. Um, hi, my name is Mini Chang. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Seoul National University. And these are my educational backgrounds. Um, if I inter briefly introduce my research area, uh, during PhD, I studied on the mechanism of tropical cyclogenesis, particularly looking at deep convection evolution observed from satellites. As an extension of my PhD topic, I'm examining tropical cyclogenesis representation in the reanalysis by comparing with, it with satellite observation. Um, but I also broaden my research area by also examining climatological characteristics of weather extremes, especially over Korea, as listed here. And I believe that these topics are um, partially related with one of the grand challenges, which is weather and climate extremes, suggested by WCRP, and also partially related with SPARC, one of the core projects in the WCRP. So, um, Kangyan and I thought of three ideas on how ECS can benefit from WCRP. The first two things are a little bit similar with Japan team, but we we brought a little bit of more specific um, way of how to achieve it. So the first idea is about like designating a local branch to manage WCRP activities, um, like. Uh, uh, like Misako said, that there are already a lot of resources provided for ECS from WCRP, but uh, actually many Korean scientists do not have um, a lot of information about what they are doing. So there are summer schools, travel grants, and webinars, but um, such information is not well communicated to the East Asia community, at least for Korean scientists. So we thought that it would be great to have local branch which would easily control the information in an adequate way for each country. And then ECS will be more aware of WCRP activities and can benefit from it. Second idea is about setting up an ECS quota for the WCRP activities. Because as Kangyan and I got a chance to participate in this forum, it was a great opportunity to get know what WCRP was doing. So we thought that it's better to participate it than just knowing it. So I believe that the six ECS um, scientists uh, will be a having a good start of like engaging their self, engaging themselves to WCRP. And also there must be some scientists uh, who has lack of connection to local and global community, but if they get chance to participate on any of WCRP activity, uh, then they will, it will be a good start for them to get engaged to these communities. 
the last one is a little bit different kind from the previous ones. So in terms of getting a job, many ECS would remain in the academy, but a lot of ECS also concern about how to apply our skills and knowledge to practical areas. Although our field equips students with decent programming skill or data processing skill, they are yet less applied to beyond the academy and people from other fields do not really know about us. So we thought that, oh, we know it, this is a little bit challenging, but if WCRP can help advertising what meteorologists or environmental scientists can do or how our knowledge can be applied, it will be a big help to ECS. So these are the three ideas that Kang Yan and I had. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, thank you, Hyung Jun, for um, facilitating that. And thanks to our early career scientists. There's lots of really interesting ideas in there. And so what I'd like to do now is move straight to, as I anticipated, we're probably about 10 minutes behind, but that's OK. Um, I'd like to move straight to um, our discussion session. And I'm going to um, begin by asking some of my colleagues to ask some um, questions that have been posted. So I'm going to start with um, Chingyuan Duan, who had some questions to each of the agencies. Are you able to ask your question, Chingyuan? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, you know, my, my question uh, to uh, those uh, uh, national agency uh, representative is uh, about uh, first of all, uh, you know, I'm a hydrologist and I listen to your talk, it's all climate. And I wonder uh, how, uh, how you, uh, you know, interact with the uh, climate service user and particularly, you know, trying to uh, uh, serve, uh, you know, those users like hydrologists, you know, we are interested in uh, in getting those climate uh, prediction information. And uh, uh, so right now, you know, there is an issue of, uh, you know, we can get some of the uh, like SQS, which is on the web, or we can get Tiki, which is also on the web. But some of your service product seems like are not directly accessible uh, to our community, uh, you know, unless maybe, <laughs> You know, uh, you are inside. So that's one question. Okay, you know, uh, how how do you serve? How do you interact with the climate uh, service user? Uh, that's to all of the all of you. And another thing is that about the uh, uh, collaboration between the countries. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, interaction internationally through WCIP or through many of those uh, WCIP or the minister uh, core project like GWAX, CLIWA. But uh, seems like uh, you know the uh, three country, uh, you know, the East Asia countries, you know, we don't have too much uh, in terms of collaboration. So I want all of you to comment on. Thank you. Um, so which of our speakers would like to answer those two questions? Um. Uh, can I? Pamela Zai? I want to take lead. <laughs> Thank you. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, for the first one regarding to, you know, link to the hydrology, I think uh, uh, extreme uh, prediction for the extreme events is a good uh, connection. I think, like if we can predict there is a you know the, the heavy precipitation or much more than normal precipitation in a basin area, then uh, it, it's clearly can link to the, uh, the to the flood uh, prevention. I think, uh, of course also can uh, by the uh, technical development like the nested model or something but uh, i'm not quite sure if uh, for uh, climate prediction if it's workable or not can can be directly used for the hydrologic model or not but i think uh, extreme events is a good connection and uh, uh, also of course there is a uh, uh, regarding to you know, more uh, 
uh, oriented to the users, I think uh, even in the agency cooperation inside the country are very crucial. Now, uh, in my country, uh, we have hydrological department and meteorological department uh, separated, uh, different departments. And uh, uh, of course, each year also have some uh, consultation meetings together uh, before the, we like in, in, in spring time, we predict the monsoon rainfall uh, you know, for, for, for different regions in Eastern China. I think that's type of cooperation mechanism already existed. Regarding on the uh, climate change cooperation in uh, three countries, I think uh, operational activity, I'm not sure if it still exists or not. I think already performed, you know, conducted for more than 10 years, I would say. There is a, a system on Monsoon, East Asian Monsoon Prediction Forum uh, 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 under the WMO Regional Climate Framework, I think. Uh, each year uh, there is a forum. Uh, my, my colleague in Korea and Japan maybe know better than me. Uh, I, I I used to work in National Climate Center, but now in recent 10 years, I shifted to the uh, research community. So I, I would say that uh, we do have mechanism exist uh, in three countries for climate prediction, climate service, but from research point of view, how to enhance cooperation, I think that's up to WCRP. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Would either of the other speakers like to add anything more? Uh, okay, this is uh, Yoshino Yoikawa. Thank you. Go ahead. PCC. So, uh, in my understanding, in my understanding, your question is uh, uh, <clears throat> outreach effort to the climate prediction users. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. So, uh, the reaching out to the uh, climate prediction users uh, is uh, uh, most important issue we have been addressing for the past ten years. So until now, uh, we have identified uh, very pros prospective users, uh, including uh, agriculture or uh, cons commercial uh, companies or, or so. But at the moment, those uh, pros Prospective users, so prospective products uh, that is likely to be used for by the, those users are unfortunately limited a little bit shorter period predictions, such as two weeks or at least one month. So uh, now, what we are now trying to do is to extend uh, the time horizon of climate predictions. So <clears throat> we are now trying to find uh, prospective users of the longer term, one month, three months, or uh, six months uh, climate predictions of, uh, of <coughs> GMS. <coughs> okay, so that is the current situation of GMS uh, okay. climate prediction user. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have time for too many more questions, but there's a few more that I'll see if we can answer. Um, and I'm not sure, Fang Lee, whether you wanted to answer the two I assigned to you or you might not have had a chance to see them. I'm happy to read them out. Um, uh, go, please go. Yeah, uh, so there's, uh, there are two questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, for the three, you know, uh, scientists from uh, Sema, Kama, and Jema, the first is: uh, Are there any task force teams for rapid extreme event attribution in China, Japan, and Korea? They have uh, an example: is Noah has a broad task force team. The second question is: uh, If Kama, Jema, and Sema have any long-term plan 
for Earth system prediction. At present, you already have climate prediction. So the question is, if you have a, you know, a plan for Earth system prediction. Thank you. Uh, me again, Hamao Zai. Thank you. Yes, so for, for the first one, regarding on the, uh, the, the, the rapid attribution to the extreme event, it depends on the model skill, I think. And uh, we should have a high resolution models. I think uh, I haven't seen uh, any uh, system exist in our region. And also, maybe for, for the monsoon regions, it's more challenge, more difficult than other regions. So for heat wave, it's uh, easy, uh, but for precipitation, I think it's still, still very challenging. And uh, 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 the, the second one is regarding the Earth system model development. I, I, I think now, uh, or a lot of meteorological agency, even like uh, uh, CMA, for the next 10 years, also try to develop a system model. But to my understanding, this is more like climate change issue and uh, uh, link, uh, link to carbon cycle. I think not uh, re uh, real, you know, uh, like predict everything. And uh, uh, just to take into account the uh, biophysical, uh, uh, biogeochemical process inside. I think that's the major, uh, major inclusion. Thank you very much for the answers. And we're getting lots more questions in the Q&A than we've got time to answer yeah. today. Yeah, I, see, I see my colleague here, Tong Wen Wu. He is a, a leading scientist in, in, in CM working on developing a system model. Maybe he can <laughs> give us an answer to this. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yes, I'm Tong Wen Wu from National Economic Center, CMA. Uh, yeah. About the Earth model develop and operation, yeah. Last year we have developed one more Earth system model version one, yeah. Uh, just uh, used for the IPCC same six Earth uh, aerosol and aerosol can can be into comparison. So we wish to in the last uh, in. In the coming five years, we need to use the, the Earth model for the Earth model, Earth environment uh, prediction. I, at present, we develop the high resolution version. Uh, there are about 65 kilometers for the, uh, the Earth model the resolution. I think it's a very high uh, the resolution for the, uh, the present uh, the Earth model in the world. So we wish you use this high resolution model in the five years, coming five years. That's what. Thank you very much, Tong Wing. I'm going to, as chair and host, keep us moving because we've got about five minutes more of content and okay. we've got four minutes left on the video conference. So I always suspected that we would start this conversation and then there might be more that we want to discuss than we have time available. Um, I really am grateful to all of the speakers for staying on and answering some of the questions. We've tried to answer some of them in the by text box as well. But I'm actually going to share my screen now to, um, to finish off this forum with um, some important um, information and, and messages for you all. So I hope that's okay. Um, so I'll just share my screen now. And so we are right at the end now. So we'll just skip past that. Um, as I said, I've only got a few minutes left, but we are very keen to continue um, to engage with you in whatever way is possible because you can continue to help us shape the future of WCRP. We welcome your feedback and suggestions and questions. Um, we invite you to continue working with us as we um, 
develop and deliver our research. And we've had some interesting ideas and the beginnings of perhaps some ideas for some collaboration in the East Eastern Asian region. So I think there is more to discuss still. Um, I wanted to also, on behalf of the broader WCIP, express our gratitude to everyone that has supported us so far in terms of the journey that WCRP has been on for decades, but in particular for where we're going with our new strategy and our new initiatives. And we really want to welcome you to continue with us on this journey, whether that's to foster and coordinate the science that's important to you, or whether that's around co-designing and possibly even co-producing climate information. So we just want to continue to work with you. Um, this includes um, our sponsors and partners and nations to support your needs. Um, so you're probably wondering, well, how can we connect with you? I'll, I'll put that up on the last slide. Um, but just in terms of where we're at today, we've had some really interesting discussions. I can see, and I know others from the WCRP can see um, alignment and synergies between the research going on and the research priorities in this region and some of what we're identifying in our new science initiatives and our ongoing core projects. So we would like to see this forum as being just the first. We would like to explore ideas for follow-up activities, whether that's um, additional forums like this one or whether it's more bilateral discussions. So two examples might be, um, um, if you're sitting in an agency that wishes to work more closely with us, please contact us so we can talk about how to strengthen those partnerships and talk about research that um, is of mutual benefit or indeed um, research activities that we could co-design. We do want to strengthen the early career community in the Eastern Asia region and we're not quite sure yet what to do, but our early career scientists have given us some really good ideas today. Um, there are some links that I've put there on the WCRP webpage um, that already talks about some of our activities for um, early and mid-career scientists, but you might be interested in building an informal or formal network for Eastern Asia, and if so, get in touch with us. Um, and we can put you in touch with YES as well, um, which is the Young Earth System Scientist Group who I know are on this call and are very interested to strengthen their engagement with early career researchers in Eastern Asia. So as I think you're getting the message, we're very keen to connect with you. Um, we will follow up with you after this forum. If you'd rather not um, you know, have us contact you, let us know at that first contact point and we'll make sure that you're unsubscribed. But we're, we're going to be um, sending out some simple questions, some, a simple questionnaire to get some ideas from you about what we can do next. And if you do want to know more or want to be involved with the WCRP, then here's a bunch of websites that you can go and look at on the um, WCRP web pages. Uh, the first is actually the email address if you've got questions or ideas to follow up with us. Um, the second is you can register at that link for getting updates from the WCRP. Or you can register at this one <laughs> to tell us more about you and what your interests are so that we can perhaps more tailor what we share with you. And in general, keep an eye on our website for updates. Um, we also are on social media, on, face, uh, on, on Twitter, so you can follow us there. So I'm going to finish here by thanking you all um, very sincerely for coming along today, taking your time to, to join with us, particularly to our speakers. Um, I really appreciate your effort and your involvement. And as I've said several times, we truly hope that this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end, and we want to keep engaging with you. Um, as I'm sure you all appreciate there, we're in unprecedented times where there is a greater than ever demand for actionable climate information across all sectors of our society. And 
as a World Climate Research Program, we want to take a lead in ensuring that our science is producing, is providing that rigorous uh, climate foundation um, that is needed. But of course, we need to bring in other sciences as well. And so we're keen to facilitate those collaborations as well. I hope you've had a chance to learn a little bit more about the World Climate Research Program, our purpose and our priorities and how we're organized. But we're involved, we are evolving. And that's why we want to keep in touch with you so that um, we can, you can help shape the way that evolution happens. Um, as I've said, um, partnerships are essential. And so um, we really welcome uh, following up with you. Um, we can only achieve our vision um, by partnering as well. So we welcome you to join with us, whether you're a researcher, a team of researchers, or an agency or a sponsor. Um, please keep in touch with us and thank you again for your time and have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.